Okay, so here we go, guys. So welcome to our first webinar in the new IGNIS series. And um, IGNIS is the Latin word for um, spark or ignite. And that is exactly what we are hoping to do today to ignite your curiosity about flipped instruction. This series is being brought to you by SBCTC eLearning and ATL. My name is Alyssa Sells, and I'm the SBCTC eLearning Program Administrator. My counterpart, Jennifer Wessem, who is the SBCTC Program Administrator for Faculty Development, uh, was unable to join us today because she's um, attending a retreat, but she's the other half of um, this duo that helped to bring this webinar to life today. Also joining us this afternoon is our Blackboard Collaborate rep, Amber Goulart. Amber, did I say your name right? Not sure. OK. Um, and she's graciously agreed to help me moderate this afternoon and provide technical support. And it's snowing in her neck of the woods right now, so we might lose her mid-session. And if that happens, um, I may call on um, my friend Mark Carbon to help me do some moderating. We are so excited to offer this webinar series to you, and we have a great lineup of presenters for you today, and I'll be introducing them to you shortly. I'd also like to take this opportunity to thank our presenters for coming today and being willing to share their experience and knowledge with all of us, and to all of you for attending this session. Uh, the turnout, um, we're at 34, and um, I think that's fabulous. For um, any of you who may want to go back and watch this session, we are recording it. And you will be able to access the recording on um, Jennifer's ATL blog. And I am pasting the link to that into the chat right now so you can grab that. Please feel free to share that with friends and neighbors who you might think will be interested in um, checking it out later. And right now, we are going to get started by running through a few of the Collaborate tools and doing a few quick group activities. So I'm going to go ahead and advance our slides. If you haven't tested your audio yet, please go ahead and do that now. And you can do that by going to your Tools menu and clicking on the Audio Setup Wizard. For those of you who um, are not experienced Collaborate users, um, here is a slide that shows our meeting interface and shows you where the different parts of the interface are. We have a whiteboard. We have some whiteboard tools. We're going to look at those in uh, just a minute. You have a participants window where it shows everyone who's logged in, and then, of course, the chat there on the bottom. All right, so in the participants window, you will see some tools that you can use. There are emoticons if you want to give us a smiley face. Or if you need to step away from the session, you can mark yourself as away. Raise your hand when you'd like to speak. We're also going to do um, a couple of quick polls of the group here in a second. You'll be using that polling tool. You can see the permissions that you're granted as a participant. And when your little blue microphone is showing, that means that your talk button is on. All right, in the chat window, uh, you can go ahead and type whatever questions you might have into the chat box. And um, the tab marked room is chat with everyone. And then there's a moderators tab for private chatting for the moderators. All right, uh, our whiteboard tools, we are going to use these on the next slide. So listen up. If you hover your mouse over a tool on the toolbar, you can read the tool description and see what that does. Right now, I would like you to click on that sun icon and hold it, and it will expand, and you can pick a pointer tool. So if everybody could go ahead and uh, pick a pointer tool, because we're going to use that on the next slide, that would be great. I'll give you just one second to get that figured out. All right, so we're going to test our pointer tools. And I would like you to find on this map where you are and mark that for me. I'm going to go ahead and do that now. Some of you are faster than I am. I am up here by Everett. 
Oh, I see lots of people. We got Yakima, someone near Walla Walla. Awesome. You guys, this is fantastic. It's really cool to be able to see um, where you're all at. Okay, we'll give you just one second for everybody else to participate. Look at those populating in there. That is so cool. All right, looks like we've got a really great group today. Lots of people. Someone is swimming. Yeah, I saw that, Jackie. <laughs> I wouldn't want to be the swimmer. Maybe Grace Harbor? Not sure who's up there. That's me, Kathleen. <laughs> All right. So um, our first poll today is a demographic poll of our audience. And we want to know who you are. Are you full-time faculty? Are you part-time faculty? Are you an administrator, staff, or a CBO partner? Um, we are going to use the polling tool, and you'll see that um, here. It's marked with an A. You can just go there and um, mark your answers. Your answer will show right next to your name. Ed, um, I see your question. The pointer tool is that little sun icon, if you need to find that. You guys can slow me down if I'm going too fast. Sometimes when I get really excited, I talk really, really fast. All right, so looks like we've got lots of answers in here. I am going to publish the poll so you guys can see what we're doing here. Okay, so there's our poll answers right there. So we've got, um, let's see if I can't move that down, but we've got lots of full-time people. Um, looks like we've got um, a good group, a good cross-section of people. We do have some people that haven't answered. So if you haven't answered, go ahead and take the opportunity to do that now. Thanks, Amber. Did you move that down for me? A <laughs> couple of administrators joining us, some staff. Okay. Kind of fun just to kind of see who we are and um, find out what we're doing. Oh, no, I only have two minutes left. We have to go faster. Okay. Uh, we're going to do another poll. So you got to practice on the first one. I need to clear our polling results from the last one. So I'm going to go ahead and do that. All right, so um, use your polling tool again and tell us what you know about flipping. Are you a newbie? Are you flirting with it? You haven't tried it yet? Are you a flyer and you're a first-time flipper? Are you flipping amazing? You've done flipping a lot. You're an experienced flipper. Or are you fliptastic? You're a guru like our presenters today. Okay, go ahead and mark your answers there, and I will um, go ahead and publish that poll again so you can see the responses. How do you do this? How do you do it? Go up to the A. Um, do you see at the top of the participants window there's some tools? You have your smiley face, the step away, the raise hand. Go ahead and go over to the A. It's oh, yeah. a checkbox okay. for yes or no. Click the Sorry. answer from the drop-down menu. Got it? Okay. All right, so um, we've got people that are flirting with flipping. That's cool. We've got a few newbies that haven't tried it yet. We do have some experienced flippers with us, and we've got some gurus. So um, that is great. All right, moving on. Let me clear these real quick. All right, clearing the poll responses and moving to the next slide. Okay, so um, just some quick meeting etiquette before we get going. We're going to raise our hand when we want to speak so um, that we can call on you in a timely manner. Uh, when you are ready to speak and you've been called on, please click your talk button. You'll need to click it on to speak and off to turn your mic off. We are set to only four speakers simultaneously at a time so um, that we don't get everybody talking over people at once. We're also not going to interrupt our presenters. We're operating on an Ignite format where our presenters have about five minutes each. And um, they have under 20 slides. And uh, they're just they're going to go ahead and advance their slides themselves. Um, but we're not going to interrupt them while we're speaking. Please type your questions into the chat box as we go. And we will go back and revisit those into the Q&A session at the end. 
And also, please use your emoticons to indicate approval or a job well done or um, whatever you want to tell us about. All right, and my timer just went off, so I'm going to move on to my very last slide. And, um, oh, actually, it's not my last slide. I have a couple left. Um, before we go into our experience flippers, we need to maybe just kind of visit what is flipping. Um, Quick note on what it is and what it's not. Flipping is a methodology of integrating technology and concept engagement into your classroom. It's typically a blended or hybrid course that has meaningfully integrated learning tools and technologies. It is students preparing independently at their own pace, usually at home, and then coming to class ready to collaborate and actively learn. And it is structured so that students can take responsibility for their own learning. What flipping is not is it is not an attempt to replace teachers with video instruction. Flipping is not done in a fully online course because you don't have that face-to-face -face piece with your students. Students um, are not working independently without support. They may be working independently to prep for classroom activities, but you're still there uh, as the instructors to support them, and they have the support of their classmates also. And um, they have, it's, it's not without structure, so you do still need to, to give them a structure to follow and to support them. Okay, the next slide gives us a few working de definitions uh, for flipped instruction. Pick the one that you like. These are not the be-all, end-all of definitions for this. Um, it's just some that we liked. Flipped instruction is an umbrella term for integrating meaningful technology into instruction and creating collaborative and active learning. It's also an inverted model of instruction where students prepare ahead of class and then all the concept engagement and collaboration happens face to face in the classroom. And it's also about knowing how, when, where, and why to successfully incorporate the best tools and technologies into your teaching. Okay, so here are our presenters. Today is Turn It Upside Down, Integrating Technology to Create Truly Collaborative and Active Learning in the Flipped Classroom. And our presenters are Stephanie Diemel, Lucas Myers, and Rhonda Myers. And they all happen to come from the scientists, the sciences, which um, is pretty cool. And we're going to start out today with Stephanie. And I'm going to get to her first slide for her and turn it over to her. Thank you, Alyssa. Let me just get there. You so that's my 13th one. You are so welcome. OK, Stephanie, I'll let you um, give a quick introduction to um, what you teach or um, what you do. Sorry, I clicked the wrong one and got you on the wrong page. OK. That's okay. There you go. <laughs> that's OK. Thank you. I'm happy to be here, everybody. My name is Stephanie. And um, I teach Stephanie, physics if you're speaking, um, please turn on your talk button. Yep. Okay. Can you hear me? Alyssa, are you hearing me now? Yes. Yes, yeah, we're hearing you. Awesome. Thank you. Yep. We um, got you. Okay. Go ahead. Perfect. Great. So um, I'm just going to talk a little bit about flipping in general and then what I consider to be two really important parts of doing it well for me. So first of all, I see we have some newbies here. I'm going to touch on real quick why flip. Um, flipping is really increases our student engagement. We can get students very engaged working on applications in the classroom. It gives us the opportunity for differentiated instruction. We can meet students right where they are, put students into groups like they need to be. Um, and it also gives students the, the opportunity to take more responsibility for their own learning, invest in their own learning, and opportunity opportunities for risk taking, which they absolutely don't have in a lecture based environment. Just a nod to some people that have been big influences and that um, I encourage new teachers to check out. Eric Mazur, he's at Harvard teaching physics there. He's been teaching in this way for a long, long time. He calls it peer instruction. Tim Slater, he's an astronomer at Wyoming and um, he does wonderful workshops if you can ever do one of those with Tim. 
again, he's been teaching this way for many, many years. And then I don't have to tell you about Salman Khan, but I think he his work is important because it has allowed so many other teachers to have an effective flipped classroom. So something you might be coming up against at the moment is uh, the indecision piece. Should I do this? It seems cool. And um, a couple of things you might be wrestling with is maybe you love lecturing. Maybe your lectures are awesome. Maybe you have the most amazing slides in the world. And maybe students constantly tell you that they love your lectures. So overcoming that is still something that um, you need to think about doing and remembering that those students will learn more if you step away from the front of the room. Another challenge that's pretty well documented is that of student resistance. And this comes in many forms. Um, I've encountered students that tell me, I want to learn from you. I don't want to learn from somebody else. Um, students are often resistant because this model um, forces them to have increased accountability and visibility in the classroom. You see them working. And also, students are insecure about the landscape of the flipped classroom. It's something that's brand new to them, and that can be scary. If you do this, I say commit to it completely. Don't re-lecture. Don't let the students talk you into re-lecturing when you come to class. Be completely committed to the model. And give your students time to step up. They can do it. Your students can handle this. Remember that your role and their role has changed. So two keys that, for me, are really helpful to keeping my flipped classroom together are guidance and integration. And I'll go into those now. The first one, guidance. Students need an introduction to the landscape of the flipped classroom. They're not going to naturally know what's going on or what to expect or where the boundaries are. Your expectations of them need to be super clear, clearer than they have ever been in your teaching career in this new format. And students will need clear incentives as well. Places to introduce that guidance at the very beginning of the quarter is, of course, the course syllabus. A uh, course syllabus for a flipped classroom is, would not look the same as a syllabus for a traditional classroom. Your expectations of the students are going to be different, and that should be, be reflected there. Also, your tone and structure. The first few days, you know that's important, right? So really think intentionally about doing that, how important those first few days are. A couple of quick examples of syllabus language from a couple of my syllabi. I tell students that they're expected to take an active role in their learning and that I use a flipped classroom in support of that. So making it clear that it, um, the focus isn't on the flipped classroom, the focus is on their learning instead. And then I also make sure they know that the whole class is designed around them having actually done the work that's expected them outside of class. Making your expectations super clear is very, very important. I guide my students and tell them exactly what to read or watch exactly when. And they also need guidance as far as how to engage with the video lectures. They're not going to naturally know how to do that. They may want to watch them like they're watching a TV show, which is not going to work. They're not going to get what they need out of them. So you need to explain to them. They need to take notes. They need to pause the video. They may need to watch sections over and over again. That's assuming you're using lecture video. Um, one way that I do this, this is just an example from a Canvas classroom from just a few weeks ago. I will tell them, give them required reading and required video, a link to the video. Just make it all kind of packaged up in one nice Canvas announcement for them so they see exactly what they need to do by when. In my class, I post about three of these a week. And then I let them know in the bottom there in red exactly how we're going to be applying um, in class the information. Another aspect of guidance is to create really clear incentives. I'll use frequent low stakes assessments for that so that students know when they come to class, they're going to be held responsible for watching that video and other activities you have them do outside of class. The other key is um, integration, and that is creating a holistic class. So your in class and out of class activities fit together and really resonate together well. This is just a quote from Jesse Stommel reminding us that all learning is hybrid, whether we call it that or not. And a flipped classroom is a beautiful way to take advantage of our natural way of learning. Connecting is another part of integration. And I'll try to connect the in-class and out-of-class activities every day. For instance, I'll start by referring to some aspect of the lecture video. Something small, something funny, something that might have been incorrect, um, something great. I use daily announcements 
to that in which I talk about both in-class and out-of-class activities. And then I'll always set aside some class time for students to ask questions about the video. The more you're talking about the video, the better. I always expect that my students have watched the video, and that's the level at which I teach the class. When I'm working on applications, I'll try to bring up something about the videos um, when I can. This is especially easy to do if you've made the videos yourself. I use um, open educational resource videos, so I have to try a little harder to do that. But if you make your own videos, you can really beautifully customize this. And um, another method of integration is to use the online discussion tool in Canvas. I, I require participation in that so that my students will talk about both their in-class and out-of-class activities in discussion. So we'll have, for instance, a homework discussion, a lecture discussion, and then a resource, resource sharing discussion. And that's my presentation. Thanks so much for listening. All right, Stephanie, thank you so much. And we're going to transition over here to our second speaker. And um, let me just introduce him real quick. This is Lucas Myers. He's from Lower Columbia. And Lucas, let me pull up your slide for you. And then we'll turn you loose on it. Y'all remember to um, type your questions and comments into the chat as we go. And we'll revisit those as topics when we get to the Q&A. And we'll open everything up for discussion. All right, Lucas, you're on. Thank you, Alyssa. First off, I just want to warn you that I am uh, trying to recover from a cold, so if I have to pause for a moment and cough, I apologize in advance. So my uh, presentation today actually follows Stephanie's quite well. I'm going to dive a little more into the specifics and uh, less on the um, those good theory applications that Stephanie focused on. She really hit good on uh, kind of organization and set up uh, getting prepared and kind of what entails getting started in a flipped classroom. So I'm going to talk about how to continue to be productive in the flipped classroom. Because it's easy to uh, it's easy to think of the idea and think, oh, that's a great idea, and then it's another to kind of get started and actually structure your classroom in the flipped method. Now you'll notice that the uh, little image I have with my title is definitely not productivity in the flipped classroom. Um, but I thought that was a nice, funny picture for uh, what most of us think productivity looks like. So I'm going to go ahead and move into the beginning. So this kind of outlines my idea of my flipped classroom. And again, everybody kind of has their own take on what the flipped classroom looks like. Um, and kind of going off what Stephanie said there, it's the responsibility is put on the student. Now we can always say that there's always been a responsibility on the student. Um, but it's their responsibility to get into the information and to come to class with, with the information. I'm not going to profess it to them every day. I'm not going to force feed them the information. They're going to have to take the time to get involved with the material that I've given them. Uh, in the flip classroom, it's also important to provide an effective learning structure, which I'll focus on in, uh, in this presentation. And I think, again, really the, the main focus of the flip classroom is not to lecture during class, but, but to really be able to teach. Um, I think there's a big difference between lecturing and teaching. Um, when you're lecturing, you're, you're basically giving them information like, like a textbook does. And when we can explain and teach, we're actually providing them some understanding and some comfort with the material uh, rather than giving them lumps of material to take home with them. So how the flip can go wrong, and I think this is, uh, I think any of us who have who've tried to flip the classroom at some point have, have gone wrong. <coughs> Sorry. First off, the lack of structure. If you, if you don't have a good structure and a point uh, of emphasis for each day, um, you can really go wrong in the flipped classroom. You can leave students kind of dangling in the wind, not sure what you want them to do that day. I think Stephanie does a good job of making that outline on Canvas for them to get into the material before class, what they actually need to know and come prepared with. Um, that's vitally important to have that structure. And what I do, and I'll show you in a minute, is I actually provide that day when they get into class what we're doing that day, and actually a rough estimate time-wise of how much time we're going to spend on that. Um, it lets them know that I'm organized, I'm structured, and I have a direction for what we're learning in that class. And I actually tell them that um, if we get done early, based on my outline, then we're done early. Um, so I'm just going to cover whatever's in my structure for that day. 
Another important thing, and lack of structure can, can cause this, is too much responsibility. Um, when we put too much on them, meaning we don't really provide them with anything and we just expect them to come with all the questions, we expect them to come with all the material, um, we can really leave them floundering. Um, and I've seen that where, where students have been, been really concerned uh, with the class because they, they feel lost, because they don't have that direction. They feel too responsible for the material. And as much as students can get into material learning, they don't have the knowledge base of experience um, that we instructors do. Uh, so sometimes, you know, part of the flipped classroom is leading them in that direction. And then not having feedback, especially during the flipped method, is important as well. Setting up the flip. So, and Stephanie pointed this when she did her outline. But providing access to information is very important in the flip method. Um, I use an online textbook, and they can also have a hard copy textbook um, to provide access. Uh, videos, video lectures, um, and a variety of other, you know, you can use YouTube or Khan Academy or any interactive site to provide them access to information prior to coming to class. And giving them that set plan of here, this is what you need to cover before you come to class is important as well. Uh, for lectures, I actually use, PenCast is kind of an older one, but it's uh, basically a notepad that records everything you write and you say. And they, they have it like a, a PDF. And I can answer more questions about that at the end. I use an iPad as well. I don't do the recorded PowerPoints as much, but they are effective for, for some instructors. So structuring the flip. Um, again, you must maintain that purpose and direction. And again, I talked about that, how I have a lesson plan for each day. Okay, and that's vitally important, I think, to have what are you learning that day, what are your lesson plans, um, and how much time are you going to spend on them. And another thing is to be consistent. Keep your, your lesson plan somewhat similar, uh, but vary the activity. Uh, you know, you don't want to do the same thing every day because they will get, they will get bored. Um, that's just human nature, but we want to be consistent in how we're structuring our course. And here's an example of just one sample lesson plan I might do. Um, and I know Stephanie touched on this on having responsibility on them to get in the material. I do that by having group quizzes the first when they first get there in class. And uh, they can only use their notes that they have taken on lectures or the test, or I mean the textbook. So this actually allows, you know, some uh, responsibility on their part to get in the material. And so they actually get a quiz when they show up the first day, um, the first class when we're covering the material. Now, then we'll follow that with group activities. I say many lectures, lots of explanation, but it's usually an interactive type um, teaching moment where I can cover some of the details they're struggling with or some of the harder concepts, and we can work together as a large group to go through those. And then I'll have either a closing activity or a, uh, a worksheet at the end to, to finish that off. And then these are just some of the sample activities, and I can go more in detail on these with questions. Um, and we do diagrams on whiteboards, videos, Yes, poetry, even in science, we can use poetry. Um, it, that's a, usually interesting with students. Speed dating, that usually catches everybody's eye. Uh, Poll Everywhere is an interactive polling uh, program. The, the students actually are allowed to use their cell phones. Uh, flow charts are always good. Um, and then I actually a lot of times use Google Pages as closing questions where everybody can actually um, participate on some sample questions like you might have on an exam. It's a way to sum up the material you've covered that day. And these are some things to take away from my presentation today. Just, again, when you're doing the flip classroom method, have organization, have a purpose, have a direction, write it down. I have a saved um, document where I have my lesson plans and everything I'm going to go over each day uh, for each unit of material. Be a facilitator of their learning. Lead them in the right direction. Explain things. Teach them. Um, don't just shove material in their face. Uh, and then vary the activities. Keep them excited about how they're learning material. Try to touch all the different learning methods that everybody has. And uh, thanks for listening, guys. That's my presentation. Thanks so much, Lucas. That was awesome. All right, we're going to switch over to our last presenter. And let me get that for you. Her name is Rhonda Myers, and she's also joining us from Lower Columbia College. And let me get to her first slide. Let's see, not sure where hers end. Oops, in the middle of it, okay.
Over on the flip side is the one I need. There we go. All right. Oops. Okay, we are to the beginning of Rhonda's. I'm going to go ahead and start her timer. Rhonda, I will um, turn it over to you, and feel free to do more introduction of yourself. Take it away. Hey, Rhonda, um, if you are speaking, we need to have you turn on your talk button because we can't hear you right now. There you go. All right, give it a try. Okay, Rhonda, we still can't hear you. Nope, we can't. She may have to go in and do the um, the audio setup if she hasn't done that. Yeah, Rhonda, did you run your setup wizard before you um, started? If you haven't, you can go ahead and run that now. Uh, let me flip back to the audio setup slide for you real quick so that you can um, do that real quick. There's the directions in case you want to run that again. We're still not able to hear you, Rhonda. And Rhonda, you'll need to turn your microphone off in order to go through the setup, the audio setup wizard. So you want to turn your mic off. I can actually cut it for you. Yep, I was just going to mention that, on Amber. Thanks. All right, while we're waiting for Rhonda to get our audio set up, I'm going to throw some food for thought into the chat. And um, think on this while we're getting going. We can talk about this during discussion. Don't teach in new ways and assess in old ways. Add frequent low stakes assessments. So you guys can chew on that while um, we're getting set up here. Now would be the, a great time to ask a quick question if anybody has one while we're waiting. Yeah, Earl, go ahead. I'm just uh, thinking about Rhonda. Is she using a mic headset or a standing mic or a system mic? You know what? I'm not sure. We tested it yesterday and everything worked perfectly, so I'm not sure where um, her problem is right now. Uh, Rhonda, if you want to chat, uh, type question into the chat if you need some help, um, go ahead and do that. Earl. Yes, yeah, so, so this whole concept of flip seems like it's just added. It's a change of approach regardless of technology or not. And the key is on uh, putting the clear expectations up front that students are expected to preview, be prepared, and then come and engage. Is that a pretty good synopsis? Yeah, I completely agree. There's um, a lot of responsibility for the student to be prepared. But as the instructor, it's your responsibility to make sure that they understand the foundation and um, that they understand the structure and what they're supposed to do so that they can take that and um, run with it. I've used this in my own classroom. And um, it's actually my favorite way to teach a hybrid class. And my students loved it, too. And I can. Um, expand on that in um, when we get to the Q&A session, if anyone's interested. I used to teach an interior design lighting class. Um, Amber's asking if Rhonda can switch over to the telephony. Um, I think we can do that. Let me find it. Oh, you got it already. Thank you. Yeah, I pasted the, the phone number in the pen. Um, yeah. I can call in on that. Hey, Rhonda, if you have a phone nearby you, um, there's a phone number you can dial. 
Um, actually, she needs the moderator's link, Amber. She, she Is that wants right? That, no, she wants to call in on the, the participants. On the yeah. participants. Okay. And Rhonda, I can, um, I can advance your slides for you, no problem. So if you can, can you let us know if you want to call in or if you're still trying um, to get your audio set up? Okay, her talk button is on. Rhonda, can you check and see if your mic is muted by chance? Because um, mine gets muted sometimes and then people can't hear me. I'm not even sure if she can hear us. Ah, awesome, Rhonda. Perfect. Okay, so Rhonda says she's going to run down the hall to Lucas's office. So um, advantages to presenting with a colleague, a backup, a backup plan. That's always a good thing to have when you're uh, presenting with technology is uh, having a backup plan. Okay. Do you have me now? Yes. Awesome. Okay. All right. I'm using Lucas's headset, so now I will probably get his call, but that's okay. And I apologize to everybody for um, not being on for some reason. I'm not sure no why it's worries. not working. Okay. No worries. This kind of stuff happens. And um, yeah. here's your slide. Are you All able right. to advance from his um, workstation? Yes, I am. Are you good? Yes, okay, I perfect. Am. I am good. Okay. okay. Thanks, everyone, for sticking with me here. Um, and this is actually pretty good to be moving into uh, my presentation after Stephanie and Lucas's because I, I show a little bit more of what I do in the classroom and a little bit of the assessment part of it. So these are the outcomes of going through mine. I thought we had a little more than five minutes, so I'll be moving at a, a little quicker pace here. Um, I wanted to formulate the expectations we have in a flipped classroom. Describe some of my common pitfalls that I had, uh, because students do resist it sometimes, especially some of the um, students that are uh, a little more towards the A students, the ones that are um, pretty good at learning their material. They want you to lecture. Uh, also look at modified material. How do we do this to increase student engagement? how to develop the coursework in Canvas to facilitate learning, and then assessment of student success. So let's start it on this with expectations. These are my expectations of what I would like to see students do. I would like them to watch the lectures at home prior to class. Um, good expectation, sometimes doesn't work. I'd like them to bring questions to class from the lectures they watch. and. I look at it as them doing traditional homework in the classroom. So where they're working with the materials in the class, and instead of lecturing in the classroom, they've already listened to that. And I become more of a facilitator. And what this does is it allows them to spend that class time to, be, um, to simulate the material. And I believe that was also in, I think, Stephanie and Lucas's um, presentation. Okay, common pitfalls that I ran into when I went through this. Because I think sometimes we have to explain some of the bad things that happen, okay? Will the students watch the videos? I had that happening in the beginning that they wouldn't watch those beforehand. Um, but then they found out that some of the activities we were doing in the classroom they were at a true disadvantage of not being able to go through the activity without knowing the material. They realized I wasn't going to come in and just spout all this material to them. The second question was a really interesting one. Will they bring questions to class? Because I like for a flipped classroom, even though we don't per se lecture anymore, I still want to be able to explain some of the more difficult concepts. I teach anatomy and physiology, and there's a lot of difficult concepts there that I really um, can't expect them to just be able to get them um, from re looking at the lecture um, per se. So I would come to class, and they'd look at me with, you know, deer in the headlight eyes, 
and no one would have any questions because they didn't want to look so-called stupid. All right, I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Will they accept the change from traditional lecture? In the beginning, no. Now they do because they're used to it. They know this is what I'm going to do, where it's gotten around. And I have 72 students in my classroom. I teach in a, a big um, hall. So that's a lot of students to try to do this with. So how can we do that? OK, modification of material. This was my most difficult part um, with this because I wasn't sure how to find all the things for them to actually work with it. And then being resistant was even more difficult for that. So um, since then, it's been kind of fun because I've come up with all kinds of ideas in my mind, like how can they put this together? OK, and some of the things that Lucas um, suggested, such as flow charts, um, doing um, some speed dating. Uh, I have them sometimes do concept maps. Those are pretty good on putting this together uh, with the different areas. Um, so what types of activities can we do in the classroom? Those are some of those. Uh, will there be enough to enhance the subject material? I found out that there's more than enough. So these are some of the things that I do. iPad usage, infused learning is, um, what infused learning is, is it is an online clicker program. So you can go online, students go online, and you go in as a teacher, they go in as a teacher, you can ask them questions, they then click their answers in, and you can see the, the actual graph to how many students answered A, B, C, D, and you can see how they understood this. Um, whiteboard drawing, what I have is I have small whiteboards for them, um, well, I call them small, and they go around in groups, and I tell them to you know, it may be an exercise to, say, draw out muscle contraction, a certain part of muscle contraction, and they'll do that. And then while they're doing that, I'll go around and I take pictures. And sometimes we have a contest to see who can do uh, the better pictures there, because I will then put those up and we'll go through them and say, well, you know, this looks pretty good, but what could we change? And um, so students are learning and we're really working together on that. Order cards, um, that's where we might have a particular, um, like, muscle contraction as far as how does it occur step by step. And so I have all the steps that I cut into pieces of paper and mix them all up, and then I've got baggies enough for groups of four, pass them out, and then they have to put them in order. So that really helps them a lot. OK, this is a typical day in the classroom. I see I'm running out of time. Um, one thing I use is the Explain Everything app. And the Explain Everything app, let me just show you real quick here. I have a few different slides. Whoops, that's not the one I wanted. The Explain Everything app on here, um, it's similar to like Khan Academy, except my drawings aren't as pretty. And so I would do this on my iPad and explain everything, and it would be recording also. This happened to be blood typing as I went through. I don't have the actual recording here for you. But then that would show them um, I would be able to tape that, put it onto Canvas for them. Um, and then going back to. I do Jeopardy in there. Don't think I need to show you that. I would have a virtual heart application where I can show them on the iPad. Some of the students also have some of that that they can show me too. Like I said, a group white whiteboard assignment. Um, I already talked to you about how I use picture and how I use infused learning. All right, it looks like my time's about up here, but I wanted to show you just Two quick things, almost done. So how do I incorporate it into Canvas? Um, these are things that I have in there. I have PowerPoints for them. Um, the PowerPoints, along with that, I have Camtasia lectures. So I go through the whole lecture with Camtasia and post them. I have iPad discussions. 
um, surveys here, what the surveys are is that students don't like to ask questions, the majority of students don't like to ask questions in class. So what I've gone to doing is in my Canvas class, I actually have a survey for them, and I think that's on this slide. No, it's not on that slide. Uh, sorry. I have these as links here. Okay, right here I have Chapter 14 Anonymous Survey. Students can go in here. I don't know who they are. And they just write, you know, a question of, could you explain this a little bit more? I'm not quite understanding that. And then when I come in class, that's something I can do on the iPad for them. So um, that's, that's what I work on. It's not so much a lecture. It's explaining, like Lucas said. Um, okay. And this was assessment here that I was going to show you a little bit of. And this was kind of a comparison. You can see where it really moved up. This was in fall of 2012. I'm just going through this quick because I see I have 16 seconds. And this was this is comparison to this is before flipping. Same as on this one, before flipping, after flipping, before flipping, after flipping. So there was a definite increase there. Um, and I stopped keeping records on that because I have started writing um, a so-called textbook guide for them now so they don't utilize a textbook. Um, I'm writing my own in soft chalk for them so that kind of skews the, the assessment piece. Anyway, thank you for listening to me. All right, thank you so much Rhonda. And um, we're going to go to our Q&A portion of the session now. And I'm just scouring the chat box here trying to find the first question that was asked. And we'll revisit that one to kick us off and get started. And um, feel free to continue typing questions in here or raise your hand if you want to make a comment. Moderators, I will um, let you just return to your slides as needed. I know at least one person asked um, a question about a specific slide, so if you need to um, return to that, you can go ahead and do that. Sorry, I'm still scrolling through trying to find our first question here. Um, it was from Pat, I think. Um, Maybe one of you will find it before I do. Um, we had lots of good conversation going on during um, the session. All right, so one of our first questions asked was, um, flipped just seems like a way to give students access to materials. Doesn't seem new to me. It's just using modern tools. What am I missing? So um, I'll throw that out to the group. Um, Feel free to raise your hand to answer it, or moderators, um, go ahead and take over and um, feel free to answer that question. All right, go ahead, Rosemary. This is Rose, and I think it's more than just getting information out. It's a way of actively engaging students in their learning process, in their learning experience. So it, it's a matter of student success through student engagement, basically. When we lecture and they sit back and fall asleep, nothing's engaged but maybe the dream they're having at that moment. Whereas when they're called upon, in some cases, to reciprocal teach, they remember the material. So that, that's how I think of it. It's a matter of pulling them into active learning, engagement, reciprocal teaching, thus a quality learning experience. All right, Rosemary, thank you so much for um, helping out on that question. Does anyone else have a comment? Um, if no one else does, I'll add something in. 
All right, since I don't have any takers, oh, um, I didn't, I'm just... I actually, I, oh, go ahead. Sorry, I, I was trying to no, raise my hand okay. just about, about that one. Um, the, two of the folks that I talked about, Eric Mazur and Tim Slater, have been using you know, what, what we're today calling a flip method for 20 years, and way before we had the technology we have now. So I think the method isn't about the technology. The technology just gives us lots of really wonderful, visual, exciting tools to use as we're flipping the classroom. So I just wanted to throw that out regarding how important is the technology. The technology is just the tool part. It's not the pedagogy. Yeah, I completely agree. It's not the why of what we're using. Um, you know, part of it is knowing what tool to use and when and what's going to enhance it and make it better. Um, from my own experience, um, giving students access to the Materials ahead of time is wonderful. I would let them prepare for lectures. I made my own recordings in um, Camtasia. And um, I did a classroom activity called Ask Someone Who Knows with my class. And when we would come back to class, everyone would have prepared and then I had worksheets that I would pass out in class and the students had to go around and find one person in class that could answer the question that was on the worksheet and they couldn't ask the same person more than one question so that prevented people who were from be who were actually prepared from being bombarded by people who weren't prepared and it turned into this whole collaborative group session we had it was a very small class so it worked really really well and we had a big work table at the front of the classroom and I'd say by the end of almost every class session we would have everybody gathered around that table comparing answers and talking. I would always have our lectures pulled up so they could go back through and try to find answers and I limited my participation to only answering one question for me so they could decide as a group one thing that they couldn't find or couldn't remember or you know hadn't hadn't remembered or were having trouble with. So. Um, that's how I brought the collaborative part into the classroom, by giving them access to the materials ahead of time. And then they come to the classroom, they have to come prepared. And you can tell who is prepared and who isn't. And then they do something collaborative together as, as a group. Oh, so sorry. My talk button was not on the entire time. Um, that's really lame. <laughs> All right. So um, I just gave this huge, long explanation of an activity that I did in my classroom with my well, lighting we were, students in engineering design. Talking? Did you hear it? Did you hear it? Oh, yeah, great. We okay. were, yeah. Yeah. Okay, just perfect. We okay. We okay. I won't launch that. into that again. I'm going to turn it over to Stephanie because yeah. I think the question was for her. Um, Stephanie, was that from your presentation, the integration slide number three? with integration. I'm not sure if that was you or Lucas. Mm, looks like we're having some trouble with Stephanie's audio. Lucas, did you have an integration okay. question? No, I think I'm on. I don't know if there's there's on your slide or something. Ask a question about that. So Stephanie. She's having problems with this, her. Was it this slide? I'm guessing it was number three in integration. Oh, great. Yeah, sorry. I was trying really hard to stick with my five minutes, so I know I blew through my slides. <laughs> um, so number three was just setting aside some time in class so that students had the space and time to discuss the lecture video. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> um, Rhonda and Lucas, we might you might want to turn your mic off because we can hear you chatting. I'm sorry. No, that's all right. Maybe the next question will be um, for you guys. Let me see what was up next in um, the presentation um, or the chat box. 
Earl said, um, old or new school, the online classroom presence, um, the students can preview the material and come to class ready to dig in, discuss and learn, as well as be interactive in each other's learning process. Is that correct? And I think then he also asked that question in our um, pause between presenters. So yeah. Uh, Sandy and Cami want to know, what is PenCast? Lucas, I think that one was yours. So turn your mic back on and um, revisit that for us, please. Uh, sorry, were you asking about PenCast? Yep, that's what they asked about. What is it? All right. Yeah, PenCast is a, um, I don't use it much anymore because um, I find for me that the iPad is more effective. But PenCast is a, is a kind of a software program that um, you actually buy the pen that comes with the software and it's a, and it comes with notebook grid paper. And so you would write in it and record a lecture just by writing on the notebook. And uh, when you write on the notebook, it actually records everything you write and everything you say. And so then students can actually pull it up as a PDF, and they can they see the writing show up and your voice. And then they can actually print those off as well. Um, so it's just another way of recording a lecture. Um, in a different format, and it's not necessarily linked to an online database. Um, it's not an MP4. It's a PDF. You just have to have the newest Adobe Reader, um, which is free to download. Okay, that sounds pretty cool, Lucas. Yeah, some of my students really like it because they're able to print it off, um, and then other students prefer the iPad ones. I just try to provide, like, two or three different types of lectures on the same material, depending on the uh, different uh, learning styles. Okay, so um, Sandy and Cami, does that answer your question and give you enough information? Has anybody else used it? Anybody want to chime in? Okay, looks like we're good to go on that question. Um, I see a comment in here from Barbara. She says she's been flipping for years but didn't know what to call it until today. She says back in the day we called it the constructivist theory. Anybody want to um, add anything on that or Barbara would you like to tell us anything else about that? Hey Mark, go ahead. Yeah, I would just agree with what she was saying. I Way, way back many, many moons ago when I was in college, um, communications degree, our instructors would give us, prepare, you know, material and things to prepare on. And what I loved is we then spent the whole hour-long class, five days a week, talking, communicating, sharing um, in a lot of the courses. It wasn't just come in, get lectured at for 40 minutes, you know, talk for 10. And so I've always appreciated that model where you can prepare, you know, offline. And I'm glad we have all these neat tools and this training going on to help get that word across because I love the sitting and interacting part. All right. Thanks, Mark. Um, before I turn it over to Stephanie, I'm just going to mention that we have about two minutes until our time is up. But because we had a little bit of a technical delay kind of um, in the last part there, I'm going to go ahead and run the session over a little bit. So if you need to log out and you can't stay while we're finishing up, please feel free to go ahead and exit. And you can go back and listen to the end of it on the recording. For those of you that want to stay and finish the conversation, we'll just go um, probably another 10 or 15 minutes or until we're done. All right, Stephanie, take it away. Well, I like, I just like that Barbara brought up constructivism. I think that that's really apt for this particular method. And um, I think it is a constructivist teaching and learning method in that in constructivism, every student has their own learning framework. And your job, one of your jobs as faculty is to provide individualized instruction or uh, more differentiated instruction, student to student. And I think this, whatever you want to call this model, I've heard it called collaborative learning, peer-to-peer -peer learning. Um, now, today it's called flipped learning, whatever, essentially is, um, resonates very, very well with, I think, both cognitive but also constructivist theory. So thanks for bringing that up. Great. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, our next question is from Sarah Cabbage, and she wants to know, this is a question for the whole panel, how did you all get started? Did you just jump in and go whole flip the first time? 
Did you prepare activities here and there? Are you flipping more and more over time? And then her follow-up question is, did you get release time to prepare for a total flip? So if each of you could just take um, maybe like a minute and address Sarah's question. Again, it was, how did you get started? Did you just go all in, or did you prepare a little bit over time? And um, did you get compensated for doing that? Uh, do you want me to start? Sure. Okay. Um, compensated, ha ha, no. But um, I started, I basically started doing it a little bit at a time. I would do problem solving seminars in my engineering physics class. And students loved those seminars so much they wanted more and more of those. And the feedback I got from students was that is my favorite part of the week is seminar day. And finally I decided I'm just going to make every single day seminar day. And I went from there. Awesome. Lucas or Rhonda, do you guys have anything to contribute here? Yeah. Um, you know, I think it took me a quarter or two to kind of get it to where my whole class was flipped. Um, I didn't just jump in one quarter because of the amount of time it takes uh, to get all these activities ready. Um, and, and when you're teaching, you know, 15 to 25 credits, um, you, <laughs> you got to take advantage of any time you can get. So I took me a couple quarters to get them ready. Um, and it does take continual time because you do change based on maybe sometimes the class you have and the students you have. I mean, you adapt to maybe where they're more effective and what activities they uh, they thrive in. And, and so you have to adjust here. And there. it's not like you can just keep the same can lecture for for quarter after quarter. So it does take a little more time. Um, we I I know me and Rhonda didn't get paid for the extra time we put in for flipping the classroom. Um, they're supportive where we work. They uh, definitely support the flip classroom, um, but we, uh, it's just part of our prep time. Okay, thanks. Rhonda, do you want to add anything? Sure. I'll add a little bit to this. Um, I went into it full bore, so I decided that I would just flip the whole entire thing. I always do things that way and kill myself during that quarter because this is a lot of work, a tremendous amount of work putting together a flip classroom. Um, but I couldn't see doing it part way because then you'd have to go to back to lecture again during during um, the quarter. So it was either all or none for me. Um, so I ended up doing it that way. Uh, you know, there were a few complaints in the beginning, especially one student went to the dean saying that I took the class online and um, I expected to come to class and have lecture and everything in the classroom and this is just like online because I have to listen to the lectures and so forth. But the dean told her to bear with it. It was only the second week of class and actually she did find it and adjusted to it. So, and like Lucas said, we did not receive anything monetary, but they are supportive. Thanks, Rhonda. Um, looks like Rose has a question. Rose, go ahead. I was just going to add to the discussion that my specialization is the socialization of online learners, and that morphed into uh, how this socialization helps student retention and raise student grades because, you know, online, I think I'm pretty safe in saying that all modes have a low student success rate. So I started with the socialization and I publish in that area and take part in different studies. And it appears, I'm going to use the word loosely, appears that regardless of the delivery mode, if students don't have that time to socialize and get together and collaborate, they tend to lose interest real quick. And I never get paid for any of that. I have developed so many online classrooms that are kind of like at your own risk. 
And I've been very lucky so far. I have a positive student response. But, you know, we just kind of shoot and do the best we can, and hopefully we find winning combinations. So that was a winning combination for me. Great. Thanks, Rose. Looks like Lucas wants to add something in, or maybe Rhonda. Go ahead. It's actually Rhonda. Okay, great. <laughs> I can tell because you guys are sharing a mic. I know. Um, anyway, I just wanted to add to, the, to that for Rose is that I, I do agree with that because what they're doing in the flipped classroom is they're working together. And, you know, we're wandering around um, seeing how they're doing. And, you know, it's it's amazing to me some of the discussion that they have. And, you know, sometimes I'll just I'll just stand in the back of a group and, and listen to them banter back and forth. Oh, I think it's this way. No, I think it's this way. And, well, why do you think that? And, you know, they try to work it out on their own. And then pretty soon they'll look at me and go, are we on the right Right, we're going the right way yet, and so it really does. Um, you know, it it gets them involved and um, really starts to understand it and um, gets into some of the critical thinking which is needed. Great, thanks, Rhonda. Okay, I'm going to move us on to our next question. And Amanda Makepeace in the High School Equivalency Program wants to know: Does your administration support you 100% in your flip, or has there been some pushback? So this is a panel question. Um, Stephanie, do you want to go first? Sure. Yeah, I don't have much to say. I don't um, have a good feeling for how our administration feels about it. I haven't heard much in the way of support or criticism about it. Well, sometimes no news is good news, right? <laughs> All sure. right. Lucas, Rhonda, do you want to add in? Yeah, and I think Rhonda mentioned a little bit too. We, we have good support from uh, at least specifically from our dean and fellow faculty members and, uh, and even from our uh, vice president um, on the flip classroom. And, uh, and what we're doing, I think, I think they see the uh, the positive results from it, and that continues to get more and more support. Great, thanks. I'm going to assume that Rhonda's answer is going to be the same since you're both at the same college, right? I sure hope so. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> All right. I'm going to move us on to the next question. And Ed at Pierce wants to know: um, It would be interesting to know if the presenters are teaching these as hybrids or if they're just flipping a traditionally fully face-to-face -face classroom. So, uh, Stephanie, do you want to address, address that real quick? Yeah, sure. Um, the class that I'm talking about here is a fully face-to-face -face calculus-based physics class, so I see them every single day. Okay, and when the I have a question for you. Um, when the students register, do they know that there's an online component to your course and that you're doing the flip in class, or do you kind of just spring it on them on the first day? At, at our school, there is um, a web enhanced status, I think, that does appear in the course schedule. Most classes have that now since we use Canvas. So even though it has that status, I think the students are not sure to, you know, how much web enhancement to expect, but they know there will be some. That's awesome. I like that web enhanced um, idea because it kind of allows you to, to bring some different things into the classroom. Um, Lucas and Rhonda, do you have an answer to whether you're teaching these as full hybrids or um, as a face-to-face -face classroom? Uh, they are face-to-face -face classes, and um, and we we also have in the schedule when they register it says whether it's Canvas Canvas enhanced. Um, so they know that, and then it tells them what enhanced is, so they actually know what that means and, and that they will have um, resources on there more than just maybe some information. That doesn't always mean they're ready for it or uh, actually know for sure what that is. That's right. Great. Thanks. I think the web enhanced status is becoming um, a lot more popular on um, the different camp campuses. Unless someone wants to chime in, any audience? Questions, participants, anybody want to raise their hand while I look for the next question? Okay, let's see. Um, let me see where we're at. Just scrolling through our chat here. Uh, anybody want to make a comment on the comment that I made 
during um, the break while we were getting Rhonda's mic taken care of about teaching in new ways and assessing in old ways. Maybe we can throw that out to the panel. How are you all um, addressing that and how are you doing the assessments in your classroom? Stephanie, go ahead. Okay, sure. Um, I guess the, there's the frequent low stakes assessment and also that I do a lot more collaborative work so students turn in more group work and um, they get points for their discussion board work, that sort of thing. So I think lots of small ways encouraging students to integrate different parts of the class and assessing those as well as I do some traditional assessments such as midterms and finals. Okay, Rhonda and Lucas. Sorry, Alyssa, could you kind of repeat what, what we were just in there? I, was, I kind of listened and, and kind of forgot what we were actually answering. Sure, no problem. Um, we wanted to know how you're assessing in the classroom. Um, I had thrown a comment into the chat about um, don't teach in new ways and assess in old ways. So with all this collaboration and different, the different things you're bringing into your classroom, what are your assessments based on? Or how do you do that? Um, I do a variety of, and I'll let you to speak after me about the assessments, but I do a variety of small group quizzes for assessment um, where we're working on the, the material um, and they're accountable to each other. We also do some case studies um, assessment as well. And then there's different activities that I, that I will give uh, participation points for. And it's not a huge portion of their grade because of the, the classes we teach are a lot of them are precursors to allied health programs where they're doing a lot of um, large standardized testing. Um, so we still have a, a large component of the grade is testing. But try to incorporate more assessment into what we're doing in the class. I don't take attendance, but I do reward those who are there and, and participating and engaged in the material. But I'll let Rhonda also discuss um, the integrated. Uh, Rhonda says it's about the same. So we're, we're Pretty much on the same term. I teach the prereq class to her A and B, so um, we, we're, we're similar in how we uh, approach our classrooms. You do a lot of case studies. So. She does a lot of the case studies in her anatomy and physiology class. That's great that you guys are kind of teaching in tandem, even though you're teaching two different classes. And I think your students are probably. Um, getting some expectations set for them in the first class that they can follow through and kind of know what's going on and come into Rhonda's class a little bit more prepared maybe. Exactly and actually I mean me and Rhonda communicated uh, multiple cases about that and, and uh, I try to set the students up so that they're not just know the material but that they're ready for the AP class and how Rhonda teaches and um, so I've actually had students come back to me and say, oh man, your class really helped me. And so I generally, students actually get better grades in AP than we do in, in my biology class. That's great. Okay, um, we had um, some comments about um, participation and the grading rubric. So Rose had made a comment that there's um, a back door to student resistance um, in preparation and participation on the grading rubric. And then Earl said making them part of the grading rubric is an excellent tool. And then um, Pat followed up with a question that said, how do you make them part of the grading rubric? So Earl and maybe Rose, would either of you care to address Pat's question that she asked about the grading rubrics and how you get your students to participate in those? Go ahead and click your talk button, guys, if you have something you want to add in there. Um, if not, I have um, something I can add in from a class that I taught. Okay, so um, sounds like maybe we're not going to get any answers from Earl or Rose on that, so I'll just chime in here real quick and maybe turn it over to the panel if they have any grading rubric, um, anything they want to share. In my course, right, I used to be an interior design instructor before um, I came into e-learning and one thing that I did with all of my classes, whether it was face-to-face -face or web enhanced or a blended hybrid classroom or a fully online classroom, is that um, I actually asked my students to grade themselves and they were told that if they did a good job and they were honest with themselves and with me and um, 
you know, could justify how they were grading themselves, that they could keep their grade. And I found that this was a really great way for them um, to step up and take responsibility for what they were turning in. They had the rubric ahead of time. They knew what was expected. And then um, they could go down and kind of try to take an objective look at their work. It's really hard to take an objective look at your own work. But um, I found that to be a really great way to get students involved in the grading, grading rubric in my classroom. Uh, Stephanie or Lucas or Rhonda, anything to add in? Okay, does it look like our presenters have any comments on that? Oh, we do. Lucas, go ahead. <laughs> this is Rhonda. Um, anyway, I, I guess I could say that about the only thing that I really have a rubric with is on their case studies so that they know, um, you know, what, how I'm going to grade it in regards to, um, you know, did they answer the question and so forth. So I have a rubric going um, with that part of it. But like Lucas said, our our courses are so um, heavily based on exams because of where they're going, going into nursing and so forth, where they're going to be required to take national exams that um, we don't have a tremendous amount based on their classroom participation. Thanks for, for that, Rhonda. All right, I'm going to move us into our next question. Um, Barbara Moran um, commented on something that sounds like it's really cool that she's doing. She says, I found some students were reluctant to ask questions until I, I created a question basket. Students could drop questions in the basket anonymously. I think that that is a fantastic idea. And then um, a little further down, Amanda Makepeace asked, could questions be sent ahead with Canvas in a discussion so that students don't have to speak up in class and suffer the embarrassment? So, um, presenters, what do you what do you think on doing it that way? Um, that's what I was talking about when I said I have the anonymous survey on Canvas. Uh, that's what they're doing is they're dropping questions in there, so that I mean I can I pull those up sometimes in class before. Um, before we start doing some of the activities. And I'll put those up because they are anonymous. Nobody knows who asked that. And then I'll go over a lot of those. Earl, go ahead. Yeah, I, I get that. I think that is probably a very good way to do that. It's a lot better than a uh, discussion post where you leave things wide open. Those can get out of hand. So an anonymous survey. Uh, makes it anonymous without the threat of anything growing into something more than was intended. It's a good use of that tool. Great. Thanks, Earl. All right. Our next question is for Lucas specifically. Uh, Lucas, Kimberly asks, what do you mean by speed dating? You knew you were going to get that question, right? Uh, I did, yeah. yeah. Speed, that's usually a question from everybody when I mention speed dating in the classroom. Um, I actually learned this, well, I mean, I, I knew what speed dating was, but I actually saw the application at a conference in New York on case studies, and they made us in the conference actually do the speed dating. And um, What I like about it is it, it's, it's active in the sense that you have to move and you have to refocus, but I usually, I don't do it often, I'm maybe two or three times a quarter. Um, but, for example, I, I've done it before with a debate on the characteristics of life with viruses. And um, so I actually give part of the classroom I teach in, and I have a large classroom of students, but they're set up in tiers. So there's a big table at each tier which, with a row on each side. And so the, the rows can turn around and actually be sitting across from someone. And so when we do the speed dating, just like speed dating, I'll have them move to the right or something, one side of each table. So you're not necessarily speed dating with everybody in the classroom, um, but it's um, but you're speed dating with someone at that table. And so I'll give each I'll give them rules on what they have to do, and I'll give them a time limit for each amount of time they're with each other, the other students. Uh, for example, if we're doing the viruses, I'll give them like one I'll give one row. That they have to argue one aspect of why viruses aren't alive, and then the other person has to argue one aspect of why they're alive. And it has to be new at each um, 
each person. So you can't use the same material every time. You have to use something new every time. Um, and, I, and I do that with a variety of things. Um, it just depends on when I want to introduce it. I don't do it with necessarily the same material every quarter. Um, depends on, on the students I have, um, if they can handle that or not. And then to make sure that I know they're actually doing it and to have some sort of um, classroom discussion on it afterwards, I use the Pull Everywhere um, program to have them partner up at the end and then submit their kind of their final results from their speed dating into a question so they can see it up on the board and they can discuss it as a class. So it's another way just to get in the material, discuss the material, and then talk about it as a, as a group. Um, and it's something different with the students. They like, they won't do it every day, they would be bored with it. Um, but every once in a while, they throw it out and it gets a little energized and uh, a little more interactive in the material. And they like to they like to take on roles. So if you give one side kind of the negative role or the, the role where they kind of get to be, you know, a pessimist with something or, you know, to be the devil's advocate, they, they really take that on and they enjoy that aspect of it. All right. Thanks, Lucas. That sounds like a fantastic activity. Um, Stephanie or Rhonda, would you like to share an activity that is interesting from your classroom? No, I'm sorry. Just any act, any activity uh -huh. that we do that's collaborative? Yeah, any fun, different activity that you're doing. Like I know Rhonda mentioned the Jeopardy activity that she does. I mentioned my Ask Someone Who Knows. Lucas has his speed dating thing going on. Is there anything interesting or fun that you're doing in your classroom? Um, I don't think I do anything quite as cute as those, but um, my students are often will spend an, at least an hour per problem working on, say, a, dif a difficult physics problem. And a good amount of our time, at least once a week in the classroom, they are up at the whiteboard. I'm sitting back in a, you know, where like the students would traditionally sit. And my students are working in small groups up at the whiteboard presenting their solutions to me and to each other, mostly. So I think for the kind of material that we're doing in my class, that's a lot of what they do is they're working pretty technical problems. And most of the time, they're really there in support of each other. They come over to me, and I chime in every once in a while but they do a wonderful job of helping each other out. Great, thanks. That sounds like a fun activity too. Earl, what did you want to add in? Uh, this isn't an activity, but you've been talking about different ways to build student engagement. So I'm a technician, not an instructor. And you asked earlier a question of myself and another participant, uh, how to build that into the grade book, and Rosemary uh, Riegel's answer, Riegel's answer was building a category for preparation and participation for the synchronous sessions. So if you do that either per, per um, assignment or a grade book item overall and make that expectation very clear to your students at the beginning of your course, that's another incentive for active engagement and participation. All right, thanks, Earl. Um, Rhonda, did you want to add anything about any of your activities that you're doing in your class? I know you had several in your presentation. If there's one that's like your favorite, if you want to expand on that for a sec. Rhonda, if you're speaking, please turn your mic back on. It looks like maybe we might have lost um, Lucas and Rhonda. We'll let her chime in here in a minute if um, she gets her mic back on. Okay, I'm going back to our chat box, and we still have a couple of things in here. Um, again, if you need to go, um, feel free to exit at any time. You can listen to the end of a conversation in the recording. Um, Sarah Cabbage asked a question. Oh, Lucas, go ahead, or Rhonda. <laughs> this is Rhonda. Alyssa, no worries. Okay. I'm sorry, but I do have to leave. I'm supposed to be doing a workshop, but it's snowing really bad here, so I need to see if I'm still doing that at 3.30. So um, thank you for letting me participate. Well, thanks for joining us today. We appreciate um, you sharing your experience and knowledge with us. And um, 
we'll just um, go on to another question. Um, we, I know okay. we talked about a couple of yours um, during your, your presentation, so we're good. Thanks. Okay. I'll pass it off to Lucas. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So I'm going back to the chat. Um, Sarah Cabbage asked if there were iPads provided to students or do they have their own? I'm not sure. Um, what she was responding to um, within the chat box. Sarah, do you want to um, expand on that for a minute? I'm not sure if Sarah's still with us. I think some people may have um, left. I'm yes, still she's here. here. OK, go um, ahead, Sarah. I think I was responding to a comment that Lucas, I think, had made about when he was listing group activities that he does, he mentioned some iPad work. And I was wondering if that was iPad work the students were doing, and if so, if they had their own tablets, or if um, he had school provided tablets. OK, Lucas, can you respond to that about the iPads? That's a great question. Actually, I'm in the process. We're building a new health and science building, and part of it would possibly have a grant where we're actually, I'm in the process of getting iPads for the classroom um, to be able to do that. I have done. Um, activities using the, my iPad that I've just let different groups use where they can build cell membranes and different things. Um, my plan is when I get more iPads to have each group actually uh, do activities and they can send the image to me, I can pull it up. But otherwise I use the iPad um, to create my lectures to do in, in classroom explanations or diagrams, um, to take pictures of their diagrams they do on whiteboards and put them up there and then talk about them just like Rhonda spoke about. Um, if I had a iPad for every classroom, I would definitely, uh, for every student, I would do it that way. I'm waiting for that. that that's in the near future. All right. Thanks for that, Lucas. Okay. Um, let's see. What else? We have um, some other miscellaneous comments in here. And then um, there were some follow-up questions down here. Um, I think this one's for me. Preston's asking, what happened if their self-grading was not honest or fair? Did you then lower their grade? Or you said they got to keep their grade if their self-assigned grade was fair and honest. So Preston, what I did with that is I did ask them to be honest. And quite frankly, I would sometimes get a student who would mark themselves as A plus or all fives on their evaluation when it was clearly like a C or C minus project. And um, I did explain to my class beforehand that, you know, if they were fair and honest and could justify their grade and really thought that they had earned and deserve it, deserved it, they would definitely get to keep it. Um, but if they didn't um, assess themselves fairly, that I did reserve the right to move them up or down. And quite honestly, I, in my experience, got more students who were hard on themselves and gave, gave themselves lower grades than I would have give, given them. So um, more routinely, I had to move people's grades up rather than down. So um, hopefully that answers your, your question on that. Okay, Sarah says she's going to run now. Does anybody have anything else to add? I'm kind of to the end of the chat, and um, if I missed your question, I apologize. If you want to go ahead and raise your hand right now and, and ask another question before we go, that would be fine. Okay, Preston, go ahead. Yeah, I had a question about the impact that the foot cramp classroom pedagogy has on retention. Can you hear me? We sure can. So Preston's question is about retention in the flipped classroom. I think Rhonda had a slide that kind of um, addressed some of that. Um, presenters, do you have anything you would like to add? Yeah, I'll go ahead and add something to that. I think, okay, great. Um, I think anytime we can get students to focus on critical thinking and applying material um, and using it, no matter the course, I think you're going to have better um, retention rates, um, students are going to be more focused in class, they're going to be using the material um, you know, on a daily basis. Um, when you're doing the traditional method, which I've, I've done, and, and I grew up in the straight lecture classroom, and especially in the science field, um, and, and I did find in it, but students tend to, um, you can be more intimidated by that, just straight, here's the material, you got to go home, study it, come back to the exam. And, and you know that's still a, a commonplace in, in the science industry. That's for sure of 
here you go. Here's the material. Come and take the test in a couple of weeks. So I think um, for me, and I know for Ron, the retention has been, been higher. Um, I, and I know that look, just looking at grading, um, we I have less Fs, less Cs, more Bs. The B, so the curve has shifted way more towards the B, the B average. Um, I know that's the case for Rhonda as well. So your C students are becoming uh, more effective, I think, studiers, more effective test takers, uh, more critical thinkers. They're being more engaged with material. Like a lot of times with C students, they're just bored at times, um, and they're not engaged. Um, they don't necessarily have as much self-motivation in a lecture classroom as they do in that flipped classroom where they're engaged with the material every day. Does that answer your question? Yes, yes, that does. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Okay, guys, um, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up since we're well over our time. I've thrown up a slide here for you with some additional resources that you can check out. Um, you will find these in the PowerPoint presentation that you were asked to save if you wanted to save it when you logged in. And you'll also be able to access the recording link and this PowerPoint on the ATL blog and probably will get sent out to you through your campus as well. I'm going to encourage all of our e-learning directors to send that out. But these were some good articles and things that um, I had found and read some information on. Um, if you want to contact either Jennifer or myself, here is our contact information. And the um, blog address is in the, is in the chat box, so um, I can grab that again if you guys want to it's, I don't know, it's way up in the box. So let me get that again for you real quick. And I'll throw that back into, um, into the chat here. Hold on just one second. And then um, we've also got um, a survey that we would love for you guys to fill out. Again, this one is not a live link. So um, I will grab that link for you and throw that into the chat box as well. And feel free to go there and tell us what you thought of this seminar, what we can do to improve, ideas for future seminars. We would really, really appreciate your input. And thank you so much for coming. Thank you to our presenters and to everyone who asked questions and shared their experience and knowledge with us today. If you'd like to join us again, our next IGNIS webinar is on February 20th. It's called Beyond Cutting and Pasting. And we'll be discussing teaching research skills for the 21st century. And we'll be joined by presenters um, Allison Andrunas from Everett Community College, Heather Jean Ewell, um, she's from the library at Everett Community College, and William S. Durden, who is English faculty at Clark College. So again, I thank you all so much for attending. And we'll get this recording link out and posted to the ATL blog as soon as we can. Thank you. And I just want to